read in the name of thy Lord who createth, who teacheth man that which he knew not. What I want you to do, instead of looking at this from the third person, I want you to look at it from the first person, as if these events had happened to you. As if the events had happened to you. So when I say that this such and such happened, what I want you to imagine is if it had happened to you. Alright? And so the Prophet ﷺ was born. And immediately after that his father died. And so the Prophet ﷺ grew up with no father. He was raised by his mother. And at a very young age, <coughs> the Prophet ﷺ lost his mother as well. And so now, even in his infancy, when he's just in the age of around six years old, seven years old, he's now going into the world with no mother and no father. And so his grandfather begins to take care of him and love him, Abdul Muttalib. And as Abdul Muttalib is taking care of him, Abdul Muttalib soon dies as well. And now he's lost his father, who he never knew. He's lost his mother, and he's lost his grandfather. And he's an orphan in Mecca. His uncle Abu Talib begins to take care of him. The Prophet ﷺ was never known for any of the vices that the Quraysh were known for, the, the people in Mecca. They would drink alcohol or they would... Uh, they would drink alcohol or bury their women or whatever it was that there the Prophet ﷺ had nothing to do with that. He was, as they knew him to be the most trustful person in their entire society. As-Sadiq Al-Amin. Not only that, but when Khadija radiallahu anha, who was a very successful businesswoman in Mecca, she would send out the caravans, she noticed that this was a man that was of the most, or the most trustworthy amongst all the men. And so she placed him in charge of her caravan that would go to Syria and come back. And so the Prophet ﷺ at that time hadn't received revelation. He was 25 years old. He took care of her caravan and where everybody else was just going, making a profit and coming back with the Prophet, the Prophet ﷺ went to Syria, made a profit and then bought items. And then when he came back to Mecca, he also sold it in Mecca. So he got double the profit. Khadija radiallahu anha asked her uncle to speak to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa about getting married. And they got married. It was uh, his first wife, Khadija radiallahu anha. And from Khadija, he had the majority of his children. <coughs> when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa received revelation towards uh, age 40, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to go up to a cave. In that cave, till today, if you go to the Kaaba and you're standing in the Kaaba, you will notice all these huge hotels around the Kaaba. I think they're building a new hotel there. It's huge. But there's still a mountain that you can see right when you're doing tawaf. Some of you might, if you've been to Mecca, you don't recognize that mountain. But there's a huge mountain in the distance that isn't covered by hotels. And from the courtyard of the Kaaba, you can see it. That's Ghari Hira. That's the cave of Hira. And that's where the Prophet ﷺ, it's an extremely difficult climb. Right? If you're thinking, yeah, I want to go visit there, it's maybe an hour walk upwards. It's extremely high, bigger than those high hotels. The Prophet ﷺ used to go there and worship. At Tahannath. And you'll see this in Sahih Bukhari. It's the, one of the first hadiths. The Prophet ﷺ, he loved to go up into the cave of Hira and contemplate the situation that his people and humanity was in. And the vices that were happening and so on. And on that mountain, the Prophet ﷺ, you can imagine the fear that comes to a person when you're just alone in a cave on the top of a mountain and then a man appears. And then the man is telling him to read. And so the Prophet ﷺ said to him, he said, I can't read. And a lot of people forget this part about that story, and many of you are familiar with it. Jibreel السلام, Angel Jibreel, he grabbed the Prophet ﷺ and he squeezed him. 
and he pressed him so hard. So not only the fear of seeing that person there, but he pressed him so hard until the Prophet ﷺ said, I felt I was going to die. And then he let go of him. And then he said, read. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I can't read. And then he squeezed him again until the Prophet ﷺ said that I felt I was going to die. And then he said to him, read. He said, I can't read. And then he pressed him again until he felt he was going to die. And then Jibreel ﷺ told him, اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as he was walking away and he saw Jibreel in this stance in another point afterwards he saw Jibreel in his original creation covering the entire horizon but he saw Jibreel, but the Prophet ﷺ saw him. And so he came home frightened. And his wife Khadija, she said, what's wrong? And he said, just cover me up. And he was shaking. He said, zammiluni, zammiluni. He said, just cover me up. The Prophet ﷺ was so scared about what had taken place. And in fact, after that Khadija ﷺ, you'll see in the seerah, she said, Allah would never do this to you. Allah would never disgrace you or humiliate you. Because you fulfill the ties of kinship. You're good to the orphans. If anybody needs help, you're the one who helps them. You feed them, you take care of them. You will never be humiliated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the Prophet wasallam, after that revelation discontinued. You will see that for many months, Jibreel didn't come back until he felt that Allah was angry with him.